Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. How did you feel about the midterm? <laughs> Not better than the quiz. What? Not better than the quiz. Not better than the quiz? Yeah. Does that mean you studied more or does that mean it was easier? <laughs> okay, I just got them back from my uh, grading helper and I will be uh, reviewing them today and tomorrow. See if I can serve as this a gifting angel <laughs> give some of your points back i'll see and then i'll bring them to you guys on wednesday okay at least we have one that scored over 100 with the bonus you know the bonus plus 10 so i saw that and i was like ah oh, good all right okay let's uh have our recap questions why is it important to analyze protein content? Go for it, Carol. Uh, for, nutrition. for nutrition labeling. Pizza. Um, Absolutely. So in order to determine a biological activity and functional properties, we determine that per gram of protein. What else? One more thing. Remember protein ingredients? They're big, hot ingredients in the market right now. So they sell them based on protein content, the pricing of these ingredients based on their protein content. Um, yeah, during separation for research, when we fractionate, isolate, we need to determine how much protein we have in our fraction. So yes, so protein analysis is important for many different reasons. So, we described two important uh, official methods of analysis for protein, Keldal and, and the DUMAS, and both of them are based on nitrogen uh, analysis. So, but in order to get the protein content, we use a nitrogen conversion factor based on the percent of nitrogen in, in the protein. Why do we have different conversion factors, Isaac? Because amino acids have different use of Nitrogen that like Exactly. So different amino acids might have additional nitrogen in their R chain, uh, especially the basic amino acid. But Medora, what did you say? Tryptophan last time has a nitrogen in it, has one nitrogen in it. So yes, there are other uh, glutamine, for example, and aspargine, they have nitrogen uh, additional than the amine group. Um, than the regular amine group that all amino acids have. But basically, basic amino acids are the ones that change or are different a lot across different uh, proteins. And the higher the nitrogen percent, the lower is your conversion factor because 100 over the percentage of nitrogen. So those uh, proteins that have low nitrogen percentage, you have a higher nitrogen conversion factor and vice versa. What are the three reaction steps of Keldahl's? Go ahead. Um, so digestion, distillation, and nutrition. Very good. Digestion, titration. In the middle here, there is the distillation, but there is a reaction that happens during distillation. What is it? Um, uh, Carol. The neutralization. Neutralization. It's the use of NOH. It not neutralizes excess acid and reacts with ammonium sulfate to give you the ammonium. So these are the three chemical reactions that happen in, in Kelda. What's the principle of Dumas? It's based on combustion of the sample Yes. So sometimes you don't have really a GC like uh, column. You do have scrubbers and then you have the reduction tube with copper that reduces NO3, NO2, all of those different uh, NOx into nitrogen gas. And CO2 and H2O 
gases after combustion, they get scrubbed off. And then your nitrogen is detected by a thermal conductivity detector, which is a GC detector, common GC detector. Um, so if we want to say compare Keldal to Dumas, how what would you how would you compare them? Like a couple of things. Stella. Um, so Keldal uses a chemical reaction and produces combustion, but they both rely on the uh, nitrogen content. Absolutely. So one method, Keldal, is heavy. Analytica requires on chemical reagents and corrosive chemical reagents. A strong HCl, um, H2SO4, concentrated, uh, concentrated NOH. Um, and then you need to have safety precautions when you're dealing with these assays. Also, what's the difference time-wise, Taylor? Thomas is much faster. Mass is much faster, higher throughput. We can ally, analyze so many uh, different, uh, many, many samples at a time. Great. But what's the issue with Dumas, with nitrogen analyzer? The okay. Dumas estimate is really expensive up front. Yes, it's really expensive up front to buy it, but then also maintaining it is a hassle. Chris here can vouch for that. Right, Chris. So spends hours of his week, sometimes just taking care of the instrument. So it's a lot of work, a lot of maintenance, but definitely fast, um, high throughput. Both are official methods of analysis. They have similar accuracy and precision and reliability. So whatever is available in your lab, either or, should give you um, satisfactory results. And either or are often used to calibrate um, quick methods of analysis like IR. So the IR instrument is often calibrated using either Keldar or Dumas for protein analysis using NIR or mid-IR. Speaking of IR, here we go. So it's basically you measure uh, absorbance at near or mid-infrared by the molecules, and in this case, it's the vibration of the peptide bond. So um, mid-IR is often used with dairy, um, especially milk, um, and the near-IR is used for all different types of, of foods. A lot of them are powder, um, powder food. So it's quick, high throughput, it needs really, uh, accurate calibration, and sometimes there are drifts, so calibration is, is done more often than not to ensure reliability of the results. Okay, so we talked about Kelda, Dumas, infrared, and then we have uh, research methods. I'll go over a couple of those, and in lab, some of you today did the Bradford assay. So, these are assay, assays that are done on clear solutions. So in the lab, some of you already did the bipro whey protein, which is a very, very soluble protein. So when you put it in water and then uh, get solubilized in your centrifuge, everything that are that is not protein would precipitate and then you have a clear solution. And that's a must for research assays that rely on absorption has to be a true solution in order for you to determine uh, accurately the protein content. So if you have a, a Cheerios sample, for example, you're not going to get the protein uh, taken out from the matrix just by putting it in water and solubilizing. It's not going to come into solution. So it's not a method. These methods are not used for determining crude protein content in complex food systems. So however, they're very useful for research um, purposes where you have clear solutions of your protein and whatever you're trained on and whatever you have access to. Uh, most common, for example, in our lab, we do the BCA, bisynchronic acid uh, assay. Uh, it's very common. It, it comes like 
dirty agents come with the, in the kit with instructions to follow and it's very, very simple. You have your clear protein solution. It's based on reducing a reagent that has cupric ion. So your protein, can, of course, peptide bonds are reducing, but also presence of cysteine, tryptophan, and tyrosine, specific amino acids are reducing. Um, so they reduce cupric ion to cuprous ion, and then you measure the change in color at a specific absorption. So very, very useful uh, for research methods. And you need a standard. Whenever you're analyzing your protein, you want a standard because it's based on absorption, right? So you would get a standard. In this case, we use bovine serum albumin as a standard. Um, so you would prepare your standards at different concentration. You measure the absorption, same like you did with caffeine. You get equation of the line, and then you can get the concentration. What's, what's the issue with having a standard that is, in this case, bovine serum albumin when determining protein? That's kind of a drawback for all of these methods as well. Often, bovine serum albumin is used for these methods. What's a draw, drawback for using that? Did you talk about it in Lab Monday group, Carol? Does it have um, a small range of linearity? Or... Uh, I'm not too concerned about linearity because you can figure out the best concentration. You can dilute your sample to that. Ian. <clears throat> Yes, it's not, yes. So the second half of your answer is correct. It is animal protein, but what the most important thing that you said, it has different composition of um, reducing um, amino acids, the chain, the length of the chain, it's different than other proteins you're analyzing. So here kind of like a rough estimation of your protein content, it gives you good comparison if you're looking at different samples. It gives you a good comparison of which is higher in protein, which is lower, an estimated level of protein. But different proteins make up are different, so they would reduce differently, so it's not exactly the same. And you can't always, however, have a standard of the same protein you're measuring. So BSA is present widely, cheap, so it can be used for, uh, for analyzing protein in your research samples. The Bradford assay is the assay that you, what some of you did in the lab and others would do it on Wednesday. So for this assay, we don't use it for your food products because like I said, those assays do not work for complex food uh, matrices, won't give you accurate or reliable data. However, they're good for a clear solution. And whey protein is very soluble and gives you a clear solution. That's why you use it for, you practice it with whey protein in leading. So in this case, we use a Kamasi blue dye. And then what happens is the dye changes color uh, once the protein reacts with this dye. And it's really based on the characteristic of the proteins in the presence of acidic and basic groups. That's what amphoteric means. Uh, it's very sensitive, rapid, so that means it is uh, it has low threshold. Uh, but the dr another drawback, if you have peptides, sometimes smaller than 4KD, so if you have a hydrolysis, a protein hydrolysis ingredient, it might not be a good way to measure your total peptide and protein in that sample. Okay, last one here is um, very easy absorption uh, under UV. Uh, light here, 280 nanometer. We use it quite a bit when we are, you know, having a separation with HPLC of the proteins. We monitor our protein peaks at 280 nanometer because amino acid tyrosine and tryptophan absorb in this region. Also can an alien, but it has very low absorptivity. So it's mostly tyrosine and tryptophan. 
all proteins have tyrosine and tryptophan. However, if you hydrolyze the protein, it's best to look at absorbance at 220 nanometer. So if you have peptides, you want to monitor at 280 and you also want to monitor at 220. So that is essential. Actually, I just thought about this, Chris. Make, take note of that for the hemp hydrolysis. Yeah, so basically because peptides, when you break the protein, not every peptide is going to have tyrosine and tryptophan in it. So you will miss out on peptides going through your system if you don't measure at 220. So it's very easy. Again, if you want to quantitate, it can follow Beer's law. You would need a standard um, like BSA, for example. And the, the cool thing about it, it's non-destructive. You don't add anything, any reagents. So your solution, you use it to measure absorption and you can take it, utilize it for another analysis. So it is basically a cool way of determining um, concentration of the protein. But it has to be clear, it has to be pure. Okay, so I have questions about protein before moving on. Okay. Carbohydrates. All right. So carbohydrate analysis is it part of proximate analysis? Let's ask you this question to see if you remember your first lecture on proximate analysis. Yes, Madura. Um, I would say no, because they're kind of complex. Thank you, Madura. Yes. We will learn that carbohydrates are very complex. You have what goes under carbohydrate uh, category? What different components? Go ahead. Um, fiber. Fiber is one. What else? Sugar. Sugars. Yes. What else? Uh, other starches. Starch. Absolutely. So you have you have the fiber, dietary fibers, different soluble and insoluble dietary fiber. You have the starch. You have sugars, you have oligosaccharides. So it's just a huge group of components that cannot be analyzed using one method. So also, I don't know if Gary drew a pie for you. I usually like to draw a pie. When did he do that? Do you remember? And let's say this is ash. This is protein. Fat, moisture. So the, the component that is left here is your carbohydrate. And it, when you do proximate analysis and for the nutrition label, everything needs to add up to 100%. So the difference here would be your total carbohydrate. And that's what you use for the nutrition label under total carbohydrate. Because if you go ahead and analyze sugar and dietary fiber and starch, you're not gonna magically end up to 100 because this is a crude estimation. So we want it to add up to 100. So the total carbohydrate is done by difference. So one big thing, it's complex. We don't have one method that measures everything into total carbohydrate. And even if we want to break it down and measure them individually, we're not going to get to this proximate 100%. So always for nutrition label, we get it by difference. So something to remember. And is that just because like, is it more about time and cost, or is it about like we just don't have methods for like determining hydrocolloids or like isolating? We have methods to deter determine all the different components, okay. but when when you want to determine, not all of them needed on the nutrition label. What goes yeah. on the nutrition label? You need your sugar, your the fiber. sugar and fiber. Yeah. So 
starch doesn't go on the nutrition label. So if you want to get total carbohydrate, you want to do all of the analysis that includes everything. And that is becomes tedious and you don't guarantee that you're going to get end up by 100 because there's always a plus and minus 10, 5, 10 difference. So basically, we don't do that. We do the subtraction. And then for the nutrition label, then we measure individual total dietary fiber, total starch, and now you have to include added starch. But there is no place for uh, oligosaccharides or starch or maltodextrin, for example, or other hydrocolloids, beta-glucan and, and such, for example. All right. So which of the following is our carbohydrates? All of the above, who agrees? All right, any disagreement in the room? No disagreement in the room? Okay, I'm gonna disagree. Lignin is not a carbohydrate. Lignin is a dietary fiber. That's adds to the complexity of things. It's not a carbohydrate because it's units, it's individual units and not sugars. So the units are not sugar, they're alcohol uh, subunits. So basically it's not a carbohydrate. Anything that is carbohydrate, the subunits need to be sugars, monosaccharides. So while it is a dietary fiber and counted towards dietary fiber, when you measure dietary fiber, it's an insoluble fiber. It is counted in your total dietary fiber that goes on the label, but it's not counted in your total carbohydrates. Okay, so it is not a carbohydrate. Here's a question that you will answer later when we talk about the method, but uh, I'm here gonna have you circle true, <laughs> and then you will learn more about it and how can one method be used to determine starch relativization and starch retrogradation. Um, that's why it's important that you guys have had food chemistry before this or concurrently, because I'm gonna ask you, what is starch gelatinization? And George is coming next here. So he's gonna be very disappointed if you don't know what starch gelatinization is. No pressure, go ahead. So when um, there are two main components in starch, that is um, amylose and amylopectin right. that got breaking up. And then, like, when they form, like, chains, they'll, like, uh, take up water, and then they'll hold water in. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with, like, um, hydrogen bonds. Okay, so you're going deep into the chemistry here, <laughs> which I appreciate. But first thing, it, they don't break up. So in gelation, there is no breaking up. What happens is the starch granules swell because moisture goes in and they swell and then they start forming viscous solutions and you start forming a gel with starch. So the starch becomes uh, gelatinized by changing, by swelling, absorbing water and in increasing the viscosity and forming texture, which is really important in different food matrices. Starch gelatinization is important and starch gelatinization is important for digestion. Raw starch cannot be digested. So, or is hard to digest. So for us to be able to utilize the starch in our body, it has to be gelatinized. What is starch retrogradation? Medora? I guess most of the process of um the starch molecules not really living on the water anymore. And it usually can be like some extreme cold or like extreme, I think heat as well. So then the gel would like have it not being held and water is being like released or like they can swell it up. So you have the idea here is correct. But what happens is starch they 
with heating, they're going to gelatinize and form this viscous or gel texture. And then when you cool down, and over time, your amylose, amylopectin. So the bonds get closer together, and so they're kind of like yeah. squeezing water in a sense. So the amylose, amylopectins recrystallize, yeah. basically. And, and then you would lose, that's what staling of bread, for example, when you eat a stale bread, you have this texture. That's due to starch retrogradation. And uh, pasta, for example, making is really dependent on retrogradation of starch, the formation of pasta after heating and cooling down. So retrogradation happens after starch is gelatinized and when it's cooled down and over time. So is starch, retrograded starch, is it digestible? Can we digest retrograded starch? No. So it becomes resistant starch. All right, so what's the importance of carbohydrates? Let's think about it from all different perspectives. They exist, why are they important? First important thing. Nutrition amazing. That's importance of analyzing. You're, you're right, but that's importance of analyzing. But before that, what's the importance of carbohydrates? Provide energy. Energy. The number one energy source among the nutrients is carbohydrates. Great. So provides energy. What else? We just talked a little bit about starch gelation. Gelatinization, retrogradation, structure. structure, exactly. So they're important for structure, uh, stabilizing, let's say emulsions and foam. In cake, that it's important. It forms the structure of cake. Even in bread, you need that starch. You need that gelatinization of starch to happen to form that texture. They enhance viscosity. Let's say if you have if you're making gravy, you want some starch in there to thicken. So they're important for that. Um, let's see what I have. A source of dietary fiber. Okay, so dietary fiber is important. Uh, precursors of color, flavor, and aroma. So reducing carbohydrates. So the bread, you have that brown bread, the smell of really baked bread is that reaction of reducing sugars with proteins functionality we talked about that also uh stability so sugars lower water activity so preservation and the presence of resistant starch from a physiological perspective you have lower glycemic index so a lot of product development now is looking for having higher resistant starch in the formulation so that they're good for diabetes, for example, reducing glycemic index. So importance of analyzing, yes, the uh, nutrition label, quality control, ingredient authentication, the same thing with all other components. And for the label, we get the total carbohydrate by difference, but we also get the uh, dietary fiber is important and the sugars. Uh, are important. A lot of uh, analysis of carbohydrates during research projects, understanding modified starch, production of resistant starch, uh, dietary fiber components and relation to health. So there is a lot of uh, importance for carbohydrate research. Okay. So just simple reminder of what carbohydrate classification, different classifications are. We have the monosaccharides um, and like glucose, galactose, uh, fructose. Well, uh, what else do we have? Mannose, what else? Yeah, there are a few. Okay, and then you have the disaccharides and oligosaccharides ranging up to 10 units. And then you have the polysaccharides, mainly starch and dietary fiber. So some di and oligosaccharides exist naturally, but sometimes we process starch to produce maltodextrin. 
So that would be a process produced product, not necessarily present naturally in, in the original source. So that's why I don't list maltodextrin here. Uh, so these are the naturally occurring carbohydrates. Analysis. So when we want to analyze carbohydrate or different components of the carbohydrates, the sugar, the starch, the dietary fiber, the oligosaccharides. So before we start, oftentimes we get a complex food matrix. We need to remove um, components that will interfere in our assay. So I often ask you in an exam, what are the preparatory steps you do prior to a carbohydrate analysis. Removal of moisture by uh, drying. Sometimes we use vacuum oven, sometimes we freeze dry, depending on the availability. And fat extraction. Oftentimes you extract using Soxlid to remove the fat or batch extraction with hexane is another uh, way to remove the fat. So. Remove moisture, remove fat. That's often the first two steps before um, analyzing different components, carbohydrate components. Now, one thing I would say is before we analyze anything in a food product, what is your first thing you want to do? First couple of things you want to do. Do you want to remember your first five chapters? introductory chapters. It's always important to remember those introductory chapters. Specifically in this case, chapter five. Know your sample. What's that? Know your sample. So, so you want to know your sample and you want, once if let's say you have a lot of your sample, like boxes and big bags, what do you want to do? Yes. So the first thing you want to do before any analysis is choose representative samples. Then what do you need to do with that sample before you start the analysis? Make sure it is homogeneous. Oftentimes you need to mill to a certain mesh number. In case of, of that, here extractions of that, for example, in carbohydrate analysis, you want a mesh number of 40. So here I'm trying to have you link things together and remember that before we do any analysis, we need representative sample. We need to sample to be homogeneous, so milling, and then the mesh number. So these things you want to remember, keep, keep in your, although you got tested already on the first part of the uh, course, but Final is cumulative. Not that I'm going to be mean and ask you specific questions from earlier chapters, but I want you to keep that link. The whole class relies on everything we learn because everything is linked. Do we have one more exam to then final or is it final? Like no, we have one more quiz and then a final. Okay. Yeah. And the final will be based most heavily on the second part after the midterm. But like you need to know chromatography, you need to know spectroscopy because a lot of the um, following chapters will rely on that knowledge. Yeah, you need those introductory chapters as well. So it's kind of like a puzzle that you need to keep together the learning. Okay, so this is the assay that you will be doing in lab next week. Uh, here, this is a, an assay that we use mostly for research purposes, but can be nicely used when you have a beverage that there's nothing else, the, the main component, water and carbohydrates, sugars and water, alcohol in there. So you're going to do beer next, determine total carbohydrates in beer, and you're going to determine total carbohydrate in 7-Up a diet 7-Up and a regular 7-Up. So it's a very simple matrix, beverage, does not have anything complex, no dietary fiber. So we're going to apply this method in a simple uh, matrix, beverage matrix. But 
We use it, for example, in our lab quite a bit in when we are separating carbohydrates from proteins using chromatography, we want to see where the carbohydrates are coming out and are they still coming out with our proteins? We take our solutions or fractions off of the column and determine total carbohydrate using this assay. So it is, um, and if you're separate, like in George's lab, separating carbohydrates, separating starches, he does a lot of that total carbohydrate analysis in his fractions as well. So this method is based on breaking the glycosidic bonds with an acid. So we use sulfuric acid. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of the work next week under the hood because we use concentrated sulfuric acid and we use a phenol substance uh, um, uh, reactant that is essential to react with furans. How do we get furans? So first of all, you have your chain, whether it is a disaccharide or isosaccharide, whatever it is. So the acid is going to, it's an agiothermic reaction. So you'll notice next week in lab is that you have your beverage and you dispense H2SO4, it's going to heat up. It's an exothermic reaction with with the concentrated acid. So you're going to, the acid is going to generate the heat, and then you're going to break the glycosidic linkages and have monosaccharides. Monosaccharides in the presence of acid as well, and heat, we're going to get furans. So the reaction is immunization and dehydration reaction. So you get furans, and furans, whatever you get here, is dependent on the structure of the monosaccharides. It's the fructose, it's the glucose, it's the lactose. You will have different furan uh, generated. So that furan is basically going to react with the phenol that. And phenol is toxic, so you'll be very careful in that when you're adding this to agent. Um, so it's going to react with your, um, the phenol is going to react with your furan, and in the presence of acid, it gives you a compound that absorbs light, a colored compound. And you're going to measure the absorption and the optimum absorption, which is uh, max, lambda max of 480 nanometers. So what you're going to do in the lab, you're actually going to determine lambda max. So you're going to take one of your standards and you're going to measure absorption at different wavelengths and determine lambda mass and plot a curve. So you're going to determine that lambda mass is 480 or 490 and you're going to construct a standard curve using glucose. Now here's the catch with this method. It's not stoichiometric reaction. Does anybody remember from chemistry what does that mean? It's an imbalance. Yes. So it is the constant, it's not based on the actual concentration alone. It's also based on the structure of the furan. That's why if you have different monosaccharides and you're using only the glucose as a standard, there are going to be some error there. If you know your monosaccharides, you can deter, you can select your standards. You can have a mixture of fructose and glucose, for example, and, and, and such. But in the lab, you're going to only use glucose as a standard uh, for calculation. One thing that you want to remember in lab next week is that the addition of H2SO4 and how you add it is very essential because you have your tubes and then you need to dispense the H2SO4. The rate of the reaction depends on how you dispense your H2SO4. If you dispense it and it goes to the sides of your tube, there's going to be a slower rate of reaction. Uh, compared to when you dispense it and it goes straight in. So it's very essential that 
Otherwise, you're going to have poor standard curves and poor data. So that's why we use uh, a repipette. What do we use in the lab? Repipette? So it's just, you just dispense um, into the middle of the tube, and you want to make sure you have your phenol there. A lot of, in the previous years, a lot of errors happened because you didn't follow the instructions step by step, and some people did not add the furans. If the furan is not there and you add h 2 to 4 and you go back to add furan, the phenol, so, um, the phenol, furan is generated. So if you don't put the, the phenol in, then the whole experiment is messed up. So try to remember in lab to go through the instructions before you do it, because oftentimes students have to read start, and then it takes longer to get out of that. So these are my two reminders there. Okay. Now I'm gonna move into specific analysis of the different carbohydrates, and we're gonna start with mono and oligosaccharides analysis. So there are different methods to determine the different components, sugars and oligosaccharides, uh, either calorimetric methods specifically for reducing sugars. The smoothie Nelson is the most common one and we use it quite a bit as well in our lab and also Joy. Um, but all three methods have similar principle of the reducing sugar, reducing cupric to cupric. Talk about that. And then we have chromatographic methods, very commonly used if you want to identify all of the different um, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and oligosaccharides you have in your sample and quantitative. So paper and TLC, uh, thin layer chromatography, they're used as qualitative or semi-quantitative, but often or most common is the use of HPLC and GC. So we're gonna go over those. I already know the principle of chromatography. And here we're gonna learn about application in the carbohydrate area. And then there are enzymatic methods to analyze either glucose or total starch or amylose amylopectin ratio or sucrose. So we have enzymatic methods to do that. So the first step from a complex mixture, well, not first step in this case, one of the first preparatory steps is that after you remove moisture, after you dehydrate, after you defat, then next you wanna separate your uh, sugars and oligosaccharides from the large components. You have still potentially starch, dietary fiber, protein, because you removed fat and removed moisture. So now you want to take the monosaccharides and disaccharides and oligosaccharides and solubilize them and separate them from the rest of the components. So we do that using 80% ethanol. So what you see here in the image is you have your sample in a flask, that round button flask. You have your whatever sample that you have defatted and dehydrated and you add 80% ethanol, then you heat. You can sometimes heat in a water-like container, not direct heat. And then what happens is your the heat allows your sugars to be solubilized, but if you don't have a distillation unit, your ethanol is gonna evaporate. So usually you want to have this reflux for an hour, two hours to get to make sure that you're getting all of your sugars out. So basically you have the solvent, 80% ethanol, it can boil, go up to uh, the distillation unit, which is basically water, cold water running through, and then this goes on for an hour or two hours. After that, you will uh, separate, filter out, get your 80% solution that has your small sugars and use a roll valve, if you're familiar with, you saw it, to evaporate that solvent, and then you can reconstitute in whatever solvent that is suitable for the analysis that you would perform after that. So this is the most common way of getting your sugars and oligosaccharides. 
Another common, uh, not common, not so common, another treatment, we call it the caress treatment. It's a clarification treatment with the specific reagents. They, that, these reagents break down the emulsion and separate, precipitate protein, starch, dietary fiber, and then you end up having the sugars in solution. But again, before any of this, before the extraction, defatting, dehydration. So you want to remember that before you do that extraction. Then you have those colorimetric methods for reducing sugars. So the principle of this method is your reducing sugar is going to reduce cupric ions in alkaline solution to cupris. And then you have a complex. That complex is cupris oxide, which is a red precipitate. So you can either determine, measure that by gravimetrically weighing the precipitate or by titration or, which is not up here, by absorption, measuring absorption. So you'll get this very bright red color and, oh, forgot about that. What's wrong here? This is a very simple, think about it in a very simplistic way. When you are adding your reagent and you end up getting that dark of red, what do you want to do? It's just, you don't want it to be that much dark. Dilute the sound. That's just here to remind you that you sometimes you don't know how to start and you end up with a sample that looks like that. Then you want to just dilute your sample so it's within the acceptable range for your reaction and for your measurement. So these three different methods, I don't want you to necessarily memorize any of this, but those three methods have similar principles but they vary in the reagents that are used and the method of determination. So basically either um, gravimetric, weighing the precipitate, or titration with sodium thiosulfate, or if we use our arsenomelic the agent that has cupric ion in it, and then the cupric gets reduced, then you can measure color and fiber. So it's basically what you need to remember is that it's based on reducing, it, and then there is a measurement either by titration, gravimetrically, or measuring absorption. That's what you need to remember. Okay, so what carbohydrates do we do you analyze using the Smoji Nelson method and other reduction methods? So I have it there saying reducing <laughs> sugars. So it's really targeting reducing. But if you have sucrose and you still want to use this assay, what do you do? Is sucrose a reducing sugar? It's not a reducing sugar. So what step, you still wanna measure sucrose using these methods, what do you do? Break the glycosidic bonds. So basically you add an acid to break the glycosidic bond, you generate glucose and fructose, then you can measure uh, the total amount of, of glucose and fructose using the reducing methods. Oh, wow, look at the time. I stopped the same place last year. Okay, good, consistency. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday.